So now I'd like to introduce to you Michael Zurich. Please give him a warm hand as he comes to speak. Good morning, everyone. Is it John? Thank you for sharing that story, John. Um, we all have a story, right? This is a story. Um, whether or not you think of it that way or in those terms, in the simplest sense, the Bible is a story from beginning to end. It's about, it's about how God uh, created us, about how God had well intentions for us, how we screwed it up, how God restored that. Um, that wasn't really part of my my introduction today, but uh, we do have we do have a story. We have a story, and um, yeah, I want to kind of share with you a little bit about my story, a little bit about a story that Jesus shared as a part of his ministry, and uh, you know, and, and kind of be this a little bit more interactive than maybe one sided sermon. So, uh, coming out of high school, which was a long time ago now. Uh, I knew that I really wanted to study something that was going to empower me to help people. And uh, at the time, I had taken an advanced placement psychology class. And so I was really interested in how people work and how to interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to, to help improve their lives. And a lot of that uh, came from my background growing up in the church and, you know, trying to pursue that and deciding that I wanted to also go to a Christian school and with some influence from my girlfriend, now wife at the time, uh, we ended up deciding to go to school at a, a school called Johnson Bible College. It's in Knoxville, Tennessee. So going from Michigan to Knoxville was a little bit of adjustment weather-wise, culture-wise, but uh, it was a phenomenal experience. Um, you're going to have to forgive me a little bit, though, because this is my first sermon since senior year of college. So uh, we're about, uh, almost a decade and a half out of, out of that. <laughs> Enter with me for an experience. I want you all to close your eyes. I want you to think about the most recent flight you went on. Think about the drive to the airport. Think about the traffic. Think about uh, your experience packing for the trip. Think about uh, parking, getting there, walking to your, your gate, going through security, getting on that airplane. Thinking about the smell of the airplane, the, the sound of that, the air that they put into the plane. You getting in that seat, that really comfortable seat that they provide to you. And what does the uh, flight attendant tell you as one of the first things as they're getting ready for the flight? Passing your seatbelt, raise your seat. Put away your tray tables, and then they walk you through their exercise of worst case scenario. What if the plane goes down? What if we lose oxygen? What do they tell you about the mask? Put yours on first, why? Exactly, so you can help others. How can you help others if you can't first help yourself? Sounds kind of selfish, a little backwards. But the reality is that's how it is for all of us. I used this story and this exercise as a part of a teaching moment that I had with a group of um, media professionals, photographers in the midst of 2020 when the world was shut down. None of them knew how they were going to make a living, how they were going to get by. And you know that most creatives are not business people. So... I'm talking to a group of people who are in a crisis situation, and I had to remind them, you have to take care of yourself before you can kind of get your situation under control. But I'm using this story and that, by extension, as a way to demonstrate to you the power of stories, the power of, of taking that time to think about and think through those situations. How many of you actually just had a recollection of your most recent flight experience? Good, bad. How many of it was good? 
bad. We get half and half, kind of. <laughs> but the reality is these stories are powerful because they give us a chance to understand that uh, there's a concept that you can apply from one experience in a different situation. It helps invoke emotions, emotional responses. That's why comedians are so successful. They can draw upon their experiences or maybe the experience of other people to try to create humor, laughter. Uh, the same thing happens on the other side of the spectrum with people and movies who can trigger uh, sadness, maybe tears, as a part of, uh, part of that kind of an experience in the movie. But the reality is, too, if we look at the... We look at the stories in the Bible. We look at the stories that Jesus told. He told stories for a reason. Number one, that culture, they told stories. We don't really tell stories as well as they did. But stories invoke emotion. Stories communicate truth. Stories allow us to tell those stories to other people. And we're going to kind of dive into one of these stories that Jesus told. Uh, it's called the Parable of the Talents. It's in Matthew 25. I'm going to go ahead and read it for us. If you have a Bible, feel free to turn to it. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to another he gave one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received five talents went out at once and traded with them, and he made five more. So also the man who was given two weighed two more. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. He who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here are five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. Here I have two more talents. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talents in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered to him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I do not snow, and I gather where I do not lay seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and he gave it to the one who had ten. For everyone who will more be given, and he, had, he will have abundance. From the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The cast of the worthless servant into the outer darkness, to the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So stories are powerful. This is what's called a parable. A parable is a short story that is told in such a way to communicate a certain truth. A lot of us have heard this story. Who's familiar with the parable of talents? Most of us have heard this story. But the reality is, with every parable, there's two dimensions to the parable. The first is the story at face value. This includes the words that are used, the characters in the story, the setting, etc., the second is the big picture idea that is being presented. So we'll take a look first at the big idea, and then we'll kind of dig into the details a little bit. Remember, whenever you're reading the Bible, we need to take a look at the literary context of what the verse is. We need to look at the cultural context, because the reality is today is very different than it was 2,000 years ago in terms of how we live life, our experiences of life, family dynamics, etc., and the reality is if we took a, a section of the Bible out of context, how would we understand what it really means without understanding all of that backstory? So we, what we do is we, we're going to look at the first big, big picture. This section of the Bible is talking about the second coming of Jesus. Maybe you don't realize that on the surface, but if you go back one, two chapters, 
Jesus is starting to criticize the Pharisees, the leaders of the, of the Jewish people, who think they have it right, who think that they're doing the right things. They hold themselves in high esteem, and they belittle everyone else. But the reality is they have it wrong. They have the son of, uh, son of the living God right in front of them, and they don't even recognize him because they are so out of touch with reality. So the parable of talents is not told as a standalone story. But it's actually in, this, in the context of this second coming. The master is God. He's leaving for a time. Jesus is crucified, is resurrected. He's going to come back at some point. It's an undefined time frame. We don't know how long it's going to take for the master to come back. The servants are people. You and us. You, me, everyone else. And we need to understand that the, the big picture idea that's being presented is we don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't have any idea, but we are called to are, and are going to be held accountable for how we manage things here in the meantime. It's not to be actively or passively managed. We're not supposed to sit around twiddling our thumbs, hoping and waiting for Jesus to come today. We're expected to be interacting with others today in such a way to be able to reflect the glory on God and ideally grow his kingdom. So if, we, if that's the bigger context, then what we want to do is also take a look at the details of the actual story and see if there's maybe some principles that we can pull out of that story that help us do that in a real-world practical sense. So we've already introduced the characters of the master, God. We've already introduced the, the second character, the servants, people. In the story, they're talking about a talent. Now, when I was in college, uh, one of my classmates, uh, she confided that when she was growing up, she thought that this Bible meant talents, like playing the guitar. And uh, she eventually realized that wasn't the case. So the reality is most people don't understand what a talent is because we don't use that terminology anymore. The talent was essentially a weight of currency it equated to about one month's worth of salary uh, for for higher worth people but some people say that it could have been up to 20 years worth of income for uh, an average person so it, it represents a very large sum of money we don't want to lose sight of that because it means that the master is entrusting these these servants with with very much responsibility but you'll notice that he did say, in according to your ability. So we don't want to lose sight of that fact. But the, the very fact that there, he's entrusting this to his servants is important. So I want to present four takeaways from this story that we all need to recognize with regards to the, to the finer details of the actual story in addition to the bigger picture. Okay. So the first takeaway is that the master... God owns everything, and we are only the managers. This is very countercultural. Most of us are told that the money we have is ours, and we, we're supposed to spend it on the things that give us happiness. And most people don't sit down and figure out what their core values are, or what satisfies them, or consults with God about what he wants you to do with money. And so we live a life of unsatisfaction with little fulfillment with regards to money. That's how most of society lives. Our friends, our peer, peer group, uh, social media, corporate America tells us what should be important to us. But the reality is it's not our money. So we should be living with open hands, not closed fists. We should be representing and managing the things that are given to us because it's not ours. Okay. Takeaway number two. God has expectations for how we are to manage his possessions. We can clearly see that the servants who multiplied the talents were rewarded. And the one who didn't and was afraid and hid was punished. However you feel about that, that dynamic, that's just the reality of the story. And think of who the storyteller is. So we need to acknowledge that there are going to be some expectations of what that looks like. 
I did not believe that we're all called to be Mother Teresa and that we're supposed to give everything away. Otherwise, how can we minister to wealthy people? The inverse is, how do you minister to indigenous or poor people if you're wealthy? There's too much of a gap in terms of your lifestyle and your net worth, etc. How do we find out what God's expectations are for us? I believe those are personal. That means that God's calling for you is maybe different than God's calling for the person who lives down the street or three pews back. The way that we find that out is by getting to know God. Growing in our relationship with him, asking him, consulting with him with regards to major purchase decisions or career tracks or how do I best counsel my children with regards to money, etc., etc., etc. So if we allow God to lead when we're making those important life decisions, then we inherently are more in line with whatever his expectations are going to be. But we can look at the characteristics of God that are described in the Bible to get a better sense of what maybe are natural, God is a very generous God. He's a very creative God. He enjoys meeting people's needs. So if we try to embody these things in a day-to-day basis, then those are good qualities that we need to uh, try to, to instill in ourselves. You know, the end of that parable can be kind of frightening. And it frightens me a little bit. You know, which side of the eye am I? Am I, am I the good, faithful servant, or am I... Am I the one that's going to be scorned? God's taken that decision away from us. Rather, not decision. He's taken away our responsibility for that because of what he did. He died. He, he took on that burden. All we need to do is accept his forgiveness for his grace and, and engage in him, engage in that relationship with him. But don't lose sight, too, that the number one most frequent command in the entire Bible do not be afraid. So even though there can be things, in the, like in this story, where it's scary, or seems scary, we are instead called to turn toward God and allow him to lead us, and guide us, and grow our relationship with him. Takeaway number three. We need to learn about the opportunities that are available in this life to fill, fulfill our calling as stewards. So I told you a little bit about my story going to school. My junior year, I realized that I did not want to do therapy on a day-to-day basis. I was like, oh, this that sounds like nails on a chalkboard. Um, but I didn't know what to do. Because when you decide to go to a small Bible college, if you transfer to a state school, you're starting over. You're basically hitting the reset clock. Very few of your credit hours transfer. I knew that I still wanted to help people. I didn't really know in what way. And so some of my professors said, well, we encourage you to finish out the program and try to find an internship practicum that pairs what you've learned in your counseling with another area of interest in your life. So I ultimately ended up doing additional study and ended up doing a practicum leading Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University with one of the the graduate students who was in the graduate counseling program at the time, he had led over 20 classes at that point. So it was a great experience being able to help people and connect with them in, in their struggles. But then I also helped out with a, a credit counseling firm at the time in their education department. So it was teaching and it was a lot of coaching and things like that. When I read through this story, and maybe you guys didn't pick up on it, but We've talked about two characters in the story. Did anyone realize that there's a third character? It's a passive character. The banker. I've never heard anyone talk about this in a sermon before. But what I realized when I was reading through that, there's a role to fill as a steward in being the counselor, in being the person that provides that level of advice. And so I realized that that was a role that I could fulfill. So I ended up going on to get a master's degree in financial planning, ended up partnering with my uncle in a practice. We're based in Milford. But the reality is most people don't know what they don't know. And no one is taught finances now. So how can you be a good steward with God's resources when no one is teaching you how to do that? I see a lot of nodding. Everyone kind of feels the same way. 
But, you know, and I was just telling Judy today, my sister-in-law just got married, uh, engaged three, three, four weeks ago. They decided to set a, a, a July 1st, this year, wedding day. Everyone's eyes always go, whoa, what are they thinking? She's a perfect example of you don't know what you don't know. And she's not seeking guidance, so she's making a lot of mistakes, and I think she's going to be very disappointed. But the reality is, I think the very fact that Jesus mentions that in the story is counter to what a lot of people end up doing when they become Christians. They start thinking only in the spiritual realm. They only think about the second coming. They only think about what is that going to look like. And they say, well, I don't need to worry about income because Jesus is going to come back. I don't need to worry about saving and investing for retirement. I don't need to worry about these things. But why would Jesus say anything about bankers or interest or any of that if he didn't at least to have some expectation that we would take some time to figure out what the real world is like and take advantage of opportunities for his benefit? Remember, the servant's not, it's not the servant's money. It's not our money. It's God's money. And whether or not we're supposed to grow that is up to him. Whether or not he's going to bless an investment that we're, we take part of is up to him. But I think that there's a point being made that we are supposed to take the time to try to understand what opportunities exist in this life to be able to try to fulfill that calling. You know, that being said, too, I think a lot of people, they start down the Christian walk and they think that it's only a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And ultimately, that's true. We're going to be assessed, you know, based on our relationship with him. But if you look through the entire story of the Bible, community is essential. Man was alone. Not good. Woman. Right? Then the community grew. The community grew. But there's always this undertone of loving God, loving others. How do we help each other in a community to help fulfill that calling? And I think that that's part of it, too, is being able to be with like-minded people, whether it's a professional setting or, or a financial peace class or just talking to people at church about your struggles to be able to lean on one another. The fourth takeaway I have is it's not all about the money. It's not all about the here and now. Because if you think about the second coming, the context of the Bible, of this section of Scripture... It's in the context of Jesus coming back. And if we revert and go back to what are the expectations God's going to have for us, I don't think he's going to say, oh, your net worth is higher than that person's net worth, and that's not good. this is not good enough. I think it's going to come down to what is your relationship with Jesus? Have you made that decision? But we are going to be evaluated to some extent on what level of an impact we've made here on this earth. You think back to what the last commandment was before Jesus ascended. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. We're called to do that. We're not called to delegate that to the pastor. We're not called that to delegate that to the youth pastor or the children's pastor. We're called to take time and think about our story and how that story intersects with God's story. Acknowledge the power of that story and be able to then share it with others, giving them the opportunity to also join along in the story. Does that make sense? We're not called to grow that person's faith. We're the seed sower. Our role is to, just like I said, acknowledge our place within his story, share our story, and give someone else an opportunity to grow in their faith. And whether or not they're, they're, that seed's going to fall in the, you know, the fertile ground or the thorns or get burned up in the heat in that particular instant is not up to you. It's up to God. Your role and our role and my role, sow the seed. Okay? So that's kind of what I had for you this morning. I appreciate, I appreciate all of you and the community that you've built here at this church. Uh, my wife and I go to a much larger church, and the the level of intim intimacy and interaction that you have here is lacking in the bigger churches. Um, 
And, you know, they compensate by trying to encourage small groups, which is all well and good. But I think by having a, a core to the heart interaction experience with each other at least once a week is vital. So, Father God, I just thank you so much for uh, this church, for uh, Pastor Tom and the other leaders. I thank you for everyone here today. I pray uh, that, that you will grow in them the faith, give them confidence in their story, help them to wrestle with their story if they need to, and I pray that you will bless the kingdom through all of our efforts. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support Community Bible Church, we would appreciate your prayers and gifts. We can be reached at Community Bible Church, 1888 Crescent Lake Road, Waterford, Michigan, 48327, or at our website, www.cbcmi.com. We appreciate your gifts. We know that many can't give right now, so if you would, you'd be a great blessing to your brothers and sisters. God bless you. Have a great day.